Giant squid are elusive animals. Sightings are rare, and our knowledge of them remains spotty at best. Yet, for an extraordinary decade in the late 1800s, dozens of these mysterious creatures were seen floating in Newfoundland waters or found washed up on the island's many beaches. No one knows exactly why this happened, but one thing is certain. The giant squid of Newfoundland captured the world's imagination. Leading zoologists wanted to study them, museums wanted to display them, and popular magazines wanted to fill their pages with wild tales and thrilling images of the little-known giant squid. Not much was known about the giant squid at the time of the Newfoundland sightings in the 1870s. It was a creature that seemed to belong more to myth than reality. In fact, many scientists today speculate that the giant squid might be responsible for numerous sea monster stories passed down through the centuries. Perhaps the most famous sea monster now associated with the giant squid is the Kraken. In the 1750s, the Bishop of Bergen wrote that the Kraken was the largest sea monster in the world. He described it as round, flat, and full of arms or branches. In 1802, the French naturalist Pierre Denis de Montfort published this sensational illustration in his Encyclopedia of Mollusks. Not inclined to let fact ruin a good story, Montfort later reported that the beast attacked and sank a fleet of ten warships. His career ended in disgrace when he was proven to be a fraud. Although the ship sinking Kraken never materialized, a real-life and far less terrifying giant squid was slowly revealing itself over the centuries. Whalers had long known of its existence. That's because sperm whales are one of the only animals known to feed on giant squid. So it's not surprising that the people who hunted these whales sometimes saw enormous tentacles in their mouths or bellies. Giant squids sometimes became stranded on beaches, too. One of the earliest recorded instances was in the year 1639 at Iceland. About 35 years later, this document reported another stranding in Ireland. But these appearances were rare, and the animals were usually decomposed or badly mutilated. Also, the people who found the carcasses often cut them up for fish bait or dog food. They were lost to scientific observation. That began to change in 1853 when the Danish naturalist Jepita Steenstrup obtained the jaws of a giant squid that had washed ashore at Denmark. He determined that the animal belonged to a new species of enormous squid. He named it Archituthis. That's Latin for chief squid. The giant squid finally had its scientific name, but it remained largely unknown to the wider public. That would change dramatically over the next two decades. In 1861, the French warship Electon found a live Architeuthis near the Canary Islands. Its crew tried to haul the animal on board, but failed. Even so, tales of the encounter circulated in books and magazines. And they were often accompanied by dramatic images. The story even inspired the famous author Jules Verne to include a giant squid in his seminal novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The book ended its serialization in 1870. That turned out to be the same year that kicked off an extraordinary decade of giant squid sightings in Newfoundland. Architeuthis was about to enter the public consciousness in a big way. Early giant squid encounters at Newfoundland produced little in the way of concrete evidence. In the winter of 1870, eyewitnesses reported that two enormous squid-like animals washed ashore at Lameline on Newfoundland's south coast. No physical evidence survived. One year later, an American schooner on the Grand Banks caught a dead giant squid. The crew used most of the carcass for fish bait, but they sent the jaws to the zoologist Addison Verrill at Yale University. He confirmed that the jaws did indeed belong to Architeuthis. Two more squid washed ashore in 1872, one at Coombs Cove and another at Bonavista Bay. 
No physical evidence survived from the Coombs Cove squid, but eyewitnesses estimated it was 16 meters long. The Bonavista squid was smaller, but its jaws and two suckers were sent to Verrill. He published sketches of them in scientific journals. The rest of the body washed out to sea. 1873 was a banner year. Two unprecedented finds would lift Architeuthis out of the pages of obscure scientific journals and deposit the animal into the headlines of the mainstream press. This was thanks in large part to the involvement of Moses Harvey. He was a local clergyman and prolific writer who also had an interest in science. In October of 1873, Harvey found himself presented with an unusual gift, the tentacle of an enormous squid that had washed ashore in Portugal Cove. I was now the possessor of one of the rarest curiosities in the whole animal kingdom, the veritable arm of the hitherto mythical devilfish, about whose existence naturalists had been disputing for centuries. My first care was to have the arm photographed, after which I placed it in the St. John's Museum. At the time, the animal was so obscure that the term giant squid didn't even exist yet. The scientific community knew it as Architeuthis, but the mainstream press and general public used various names, like giant cuttlefish or devilfish, and occasionally even octopus. Whatever its name, the giant squid became the focus of intense public interest. Harvey wrote about the Portugal Cove squid for numerous North American and European newspapers. Two fishermen were out in a punt on October 26, 1873, off Portugal Cove, Conception Bay. Observing some object floating on the water at some distance, they rowed towards it, supposing it to be a large sail or the debris of a wreck. On reaching it, one of the men struck it with his gaff, when immediately it showed signs of life and reared a parrot-like beak which they declared was as large as a six-gallon keg, with which it struck the bottom of the boat violently. It then shot out from its head two huge, livid arms and began to twine them around the boat. One of the men seized a small axe and severed both arms as they lay over the gunwale of the boat, whereupon the fish moved off and ejected an immense quantity of inky fluid. One month later, two fishers in Logie Bay caught another giant squid in their herring net, this time, Harvey was able to secure the entire carcass. I had in my possession what all the museums of the world did not contain, a perfect specimen of the gigantic cuttlefish, commonly named devilfish or octopus, of which only some doubtful fragments, widely scattered in various collections, were known to exist. I was thus, by good fortune, the discoverer of a new and remarkable species of fish, the very existence of which had been widely and scornfully denied and had never been absolutely proved. Images of the Logie Bay squid and Portugal Cove tentacle appeared in popular newspapers and magazines on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. The public was fascinated. Harvey tried to preserve the Logie Bay squid in brine, but it soon began to decompose. Anxious to save what he could for science, he divided the carcass into several portions and preserved them in alcohol. They were sent to Professor Addison Verrill at Yale University. Verrill used them to create this drawing of a healthy and intact giant squid. Today, remains of the Logie Bay squid are still preserved at Yale's Peabody Museum. Verrill would go on to publish about 30 scientific articles about the giant squid over the next decade. Almost all of them discussed Newfoundland specimens. He would later estimate that about 60 giant squid were caught on the Grand Banks and used as bait during the 1870s. At least 18 more had washed up on Newfoundland beaches between 1870 and 1881. But most were not preserved, like Harvey's Logie Bay squid. Many people in Newfoundland followed a subsistence economy. Cash was rare, and families often had to make ends meet by harvesting whatever they could from nature. The appearance of a giant squid could be a windfall. The animals had many uses. Fish bait was an important one, but they also served as dog food and as fertilizer for vegetable gardens. But when people learned that the giant squid was of scientific importance, they began to report the sightings more often and to preserve the parts they couldn't use, like the jaws. 
About a year after the famous Logie Bay squid was found in 1873, another one came ashore at Grand Bank, Fortune Bay. It was ultimately used for dog food, but Harvey sent the jaws to Verrill. They are still preserved today, as seen here. The next major landing happened in 1877. By then, the public had an enormous appetite for news of the giant squid. So when a near-perfect specimen washed up at Catalina during a storm, it made international headlines. London's Penny Illustrated paper even devoted its front page to the story. This wanderer was driven ashore in an exhausted condition at Catalina, on the north shore of Trinity Bay. The tail had got fast on a rock as it was swimming backwards, and it was rendered powerless. In its desperate efforts to escape, the ten arms darted about in all directions, lashing the water into a foam, the thirty-foot tentacles in particular making lively play as it shot them out and endeavored to get a purchase with their powerful suckers, so as to drag itself into deep water. It was only when it became exhausted and the tide receded that the fishermen ventured to approach it. It died soon after the ebb of the tide, which left it high and dry on the beach. Two fishermen took possession of the treasure trove, and the whole settlement gathered to gaze in astonishment at the monster. Vera later sketched the Catalina squid. He wrote that it was the largest and best specimen preserved to date. The squid was exhibited in the St. John's Museum for a few days while prominent American institutions entered a bidding war to own it. The New York Aquarium won with a bid of $500. That would be worth about $11,000 today in 2021. The aquarium restored the damaged carcass, but it also embellished it with a pair of fake red eyes. It ran sensational ads inviting the public to witness the largest sea monster ever seen, the prodigious, ten-armed, man-eating devilfish. Squid mania was now in full swing, thanks in large part to the Newfoundland specimens. Moses Harvey even began to receive unsolicited requests for giant squids from eager collectors. Perhaps the most amusing of the numerous inquiries regarding it was the great American showman Barnum, who sent me an order to catch two of the very largest devil fish for him, and to spare no expense. He probably thought they were as plentiful as codfish. From several museums I had letters urging me to remember them, and to let them have the refusal of the next specimen obtained. In devilfish I could have done a roaring trade, if only the supply had been equal to the demand. Giant squid continued to wash up on the island's beaches at irregular intervals for the rest of the decade. They were seen at places like Thimble Tickle, Three Arms, and Brigus. But none could be properly preserved and several were used as dog food. The 1870s ended without another major find, but there was an exciting epilogue in 1881. On November 10th, a giant squid floated into Portugal Cove. The animal was dead, but its body was in such good shape that it once again sparked international headlines in journals like Harper's Weekly and Scientific American. The squid was packed in ice and shipped to New York for public display, this time in E.M. Worth's Museum of Living and Inanimate Curiosities. Verrill examined the carcass. He continued to publish scholarly articles about the Newfoundland giant squid for years. Verrill also partnered with the artist James Emerton to create some of the earliest life-size models of a giant squid. Like this one, which was shown at the 1883 International Fisheries Exhibition. The design was based on the Catalina squid. Although giant squid have appeared in coastal Newfoundland and Labrador since the 1870s, that decade remains unrivaled for the number of encounters and the impact they had on popular culture and scientific study.